couple of minutes till it starts. But it wasn't starting. It's still sort of waiting for this to open. Is, how is that connected, like your YouTube? Welcome back to uh, BizDev at Auckland. Um, after a bit of a break, it's um, the first session of Q4, and I'm delighted to introduce Ankita Dakar to the studio. Ankita specializes in cybersecurity solutions and is a pioneer in the New Zealand ethical hacking space as the founder and CEO of Capture the Bug. Welcome, Ankita. Thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure. And thank you for coming all the way from Waikato today in the rain and in the traffic. Oh, I so enjoyed the, you the drive. <laughs> enjoyed the journey. That's great. That's great. Um, OK, let's dive in. Um, tell us a little bit about your role, just just initial hook that we can get us started at Capture the Bug. Um, so I'm the, the founder and CEO of Capture the Bug. Um, just to give you an understanding what Capture the Bug is, mm -hmm. Capture the Bug is a um, is New Zealand's first bug bounty platform. Um, so my role, I basically do everything, um, helping my customers, helping my um, other business, security lit, helping my team with operations, sales, marketing, pretty much everything. Excellent, okay. <laughs> and ethical hacking isn't what you started out doing. No. So let's go on a journey a little bit and, and find out where you started and how it got there. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I'm originally from India. I moved to um, uh, New Zealand in 2015. I came here to study. I completed my studies and then I found, I, I mean, I did various roles. I part-timed at Number One Shoes. That was my first job. And then I worked in real estate as well. Uh, but the interesting job I had uh, was at the Information Management Group. It's a company based in Auckland. Mm -hmm. So they deal with um, a lot of confidential information. So they work with the government, private organizations, and basically they destruct their confidential information. So we used to get a lot of um, confidential information like health records, passports, and stuff. And one day, just a normal day, I just got curious, you know, what happens if this data gets into the wrong hands of people? And that curiosity introduced me to the term cybersecurity. Um, and I think it was 2020. Just before our country went into its very first lockdown, I started, incorporated my first company that was Security Lit. But to me, um, I found the gap in the market where every organization was going or helping um, you know, these organizations with their cybersecurity needs. I could see that there were smaller businesses, startups um, in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. They needed high quality services in the cybersecurity space, but they were not very looked after. So um, I think the first year, because I don't come from cybersecurity, information security, or computer science, um, the first year was just me reading a lot. Um, you know, I surrounded myself with really, really intelligent people. And then the first year for me was just learning how this works. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how I started. So that's quite a big move. Yeah. Um, was it challenging at the start? I mean stepping up into that space, meeting people who might have that kind of need. That was quite a, a big... It, it, it is challenging and it still is um, because you are putting yourself in front of people who may be interested in your services. Mm. Um, it was challenging in, the, in a way that I was new to the space, so I was still learning, but I, had, I, I was confident that what I'm delivering is um, needed by these organizations. Mm. So that was my intent when I was reaching out to people, but that was... Uh, I think when I started my company, I was 27. Mm. Um, and again, the business world in, in a foreign country was very, very new to me. Mm. I had zero network networks here, um, no business you know, surrounding. So I think the initial first year was really, really challenging in just mm. understanding how this would work. So I would start something and I, I would figure out that, oh, this is, this is not how it works, I would start again. So I think the first year was really slow. So tell us a bit, a bit, a bit more about what Capture the Bug actually does. Mm -hmm. um, give us a bit of a view of the platform. So we yeah, can... um, so Capture the Bug is a bug bounty platform. So we connect businesses with a global community of um, ethical hackers. Mm. So ethical hackers are basically um, people who are interested in telling you what are the weaknesses in your applications. And they would do it in return of a reward or a you know, 
a nice gesture. Mm. Um, so we connect these, you know, really skilled people with the businesses. Um, so what happens is this, we're not a marketplace, but kind of like a SaaS platform mm. where uh, organizations would come in, they would um, launch or host their platform onto this platform, and then they would um, ask people to find vulnerabilities in the applications. So we as a platform notify this vast group of people that, hey, say example, University of Auckland has just launched their program, they're interested to know where are the vulnerabilities in the application. So these people would then start looking for bugs because University of Auckland says whoever finds the critical vulnerability in our application would get $5,000. Okay. And how, so how do you build that infrastructure? So you've got the hackers yep. or, or the, the ethical hackers, and yep. I'll ask a bit more about how you make yeah. sure they're ethical. Obviously, I'm sure that's a question you get asked all the time. And then you've got potential um, clients, potential people who might need that service. Um, how do you bring it all together into the sort of IT platform? How do you manage that? How does that work? Um, and bef so before I uh, uh, answer that question, yeah. it's, it's really important to understand why I actually started Capture the Bug. So okay. because, yeah, 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 because I was, um, so, so I've been running Security Lit for over three years now, and we were, um, predominantly uh, providing penetration testing uh, for clients in New Zealand and global. Right. Um, so one of the instances last year, um, a, a company that's based in Auckland came to me and said, okay, this is a great pen testing report, but how sure you are that you've gotten all the vulnerabilities in our application? So again, I was really curious, like, oh, that's interesting, because I know that pen testing is a point in time analysis. Once this testing has been done, then you know, and if the company is making any changes to this application, there could be a chance that a vulnerability is sitting there in there, right? right? So that means they need to be doing this on a regular basis, but they can't do it because of, you know, budget constraints or, you know, whatever reasons. So then I thought, how can I, um, how can I solve this problem? There is a gap, how can I yeah. help this business? Um, so what I did was, again, I started my research. I found out that there is a crowdsourcing model that has been used by universe, um, uh, you know, defense in the U.S. Um, the government uses it in the U.S. Um, there are other countries that are using it uh, on a government level. But then I couldn't find anything similar to that in New Zealand and Australia. So I was like, oh, that's interesting. How can I do it in a way that could be not just um, used by large enterprises, but also universities, because they have data, right? Yeah. They need to um, secure their data. And how can I, so how can I build a platform that could be not, not be just used by large enterprises, but also smaller organizations or medium-sized organizations? So that's how I started. Um, that's how I started building the architecture for Capture the Bug. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think we incorporated the company in May this year, but I've been doing the research for the last one year. Yeah, um, I'm getting questions already through from from the the, oh, the, the, the class, <laughs> all of which are as impressed as I am at how you you made this happen, um, how you just followed cues and interests and questions, as you said, you're interested in answering questions. You always see the questions and look for answers. Um, uh, so J Jahed, thank you for your your great question, uh, and I think I think you may have addressed this, but I think both 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 Jahed and I want to just confirm this. You have no IT background prior no. to this, yeah. Yeah. No. And that didn't intimidate you at all? I'm a very, very, um, uh, I don't know how to say it in a polite way, but I'm a very um, a, a, a risk-taking personality. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I like to try and do things before I fail. So I know that, okay, I did this and it didn't work out. I wouldn't just walk by if I haven't just even tried to do something. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, no, I, I mean, there, are, there were challenges, but there were challenges in my job as well, yeah. right? So yeah. for me, it was like, okay, Life isn't fair. You know, you try and you learn something. So I think first year, and I'm still learning, right? So yeah. I think when you when you start something from scratch, you learn a lot. You learn about regulations, legislations, um, how you can sell your services outside of one geography. Yeah. Um, because then the culture comes in, right? When you're selling in Singapore, you're dealing with different kind of people. When mm. you're selling in India, you're different kind of people, mm. budget, prices. So. It's, I think I enjoy this. Yeah, it sounds like you do. And this, this actually is a nice connection with Olya's question. So th thanks, Olya, for that. Olya says, what an amazing journey. Thank um, you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, so uh, and the, qu the question is, and I think, I think 
you're going to answer this in so many different ways because I think I think it's just a matter of you hunting for answers. But you know, where did how did you know where to start? Obviously, you had that that initial tentative question based upon your your work at work at um at security security gates. No, no. So it was okay. the information management group where I worked as a customer service uh, representative. And then security lit came out. Then that. I started security lit. Yeah. So when it, when it came to actually then scaling up the idea, I guess, from security lit, because that was where you were you were consulting and advising on a more service basis. Yep. This and is more like a SaaS product yeah. kind of a company. So where did you start then? You said, when I've got this idea, I need to scale it up onto a platform and, and, and get more involved in yeah. IT and developing it. Where I mean, uh, I would say that the information management group, although I was working as a customer service representative, I was always, I always uh, tried different things. I learned um, a lot on my free time about different technologies and um, Cybersecurity was just the thing that I wasn't reading on a regular basis, mm. but it was just um, my passion to explore that field a, a little more. But I think um, when I started the company, it was 2020, so I had nothing to do anyway. Mm. So I just um, COVID. spent, yeah, yeah, COVID, everybody mm. was working from home. Mm. So I was like, okay, I feel, I, I had a very, very strong um, feeling that I should give this a try, although I was hesitant, you know, um, what, what happens if this doesn't work out. And I always, um, I still do that, that I'm doing it because I feel that this is good for me. And um, if this doesn't work out, I can always go back to my job. Mm. So that's that was the, that was my reasoning when I started. And I was, you know, yeah, I no, bagged myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and again, that, that again, complete entrepreneurial mindset. Um, so yeah. But yeah, just to answer all these questions, I didn't like have like um, a set path that I would do this, this, and this. It was kind of like this, and then some days I was I didn't know what to do. But um, I think I, I watched a lot of videos. I surrounded myself with um, founders, entrepreneurs, and then I think after one year, when we f when we first got our first client, that just gave me the confidence that yes, I can do it. Um, and then since then, it's just been repeating the same thing. Yeah, um, questions coming through thick and thin. Um, so yeah, to Tom, thank you, Tom. Um, so actually connecting with that, you know, that first client gave you confidence once you'd spoken to them, once you'd won the business. How did you overcome the challenge? Or was it a challenge for you? Maybe it was a, an opportunity, an exciting one it being a challenge, but that first time in the room or speaking to them to try and convince them that you and the team could do this, what was it like? How did you How did you get through that? It was, um, it was nerve wracking. <laughs> I still remember um, my first, uh, I think it was, September 2020, mm. uh, when we were um, in the meeting, and we had six people. So this was a, this was a group of six um, product engineers, and then there was a CTO. And this was a big enterprise in India, and um, someone actually recommended me from mm. my family, but that was it. And they were like, "Okay, tell tell us how good you are." So that was my um, kind of like prove us that you have what it takes to work with us because at that point th they were our first client and in cybersecurity they need to trust you because they're giving you their data and penetration testing is basically you're actually attacking their systems so um, I've I think I just learned every definition word by word sentence by sentence and I will do it right but I think the great thing was that the CTO was very friendly I think he appreciated that I was trying a lot, like I was trying really hard to win this, and he said, um, I will give you an opportunity to work with us. So we, we worked with them, it was like a pilot, we did a pilot of two, two and a half months, and after that they, they said that I'm really impressed. Um, so he gave us a contract for f one year. So okay. that, that sustained us um, for a few months. It was a big, big project. Um, and from there, I learned a lot because we hired few few engineers. So I was working closely with them, because beco before then I had no idea about um, how to do risk assessment, um, how to do, um, you know, what what is a vulnerability, what is what is a vulnerability, and there are different um, you know kinds and categories of vulnerabilities. So I think that project um, helped me. Um, and not just just validated my entrepreneurial spirit, but also mm. helped me uh, gain my confidence. Okay, I think I can do this because every other job not would not be similar, but um, I would be asked similar questions. And if I believe that I can do it, 
then he would think that I think we're in the good hands. So, but I think I've already always tried um, to provide very, very good customer service. Mm -hmm. I've always cared for our customers. And um, for the last three years, none of our customers has left us, so. That's great. Yeah. Oh, that's super. Um, Tom's got another great question, just following up from his last one. So thank you, thank you, Tom, for this. Um, uh, it's all about the idea of um, what we call late, late need, understanding if there's something that you can offer when maybe the client themselves don't understand that they have a problem. Mm -hmm. How do you convince them that they've got a problem that you have the solution to if, if they're not already you know, an IT expert in their own firm who's very aware of the risks associated with it? You know, how do you... um, that's a really good question. I think um, it's, it's always about talking to them in a non-technical um, mm. way. I think a lot of um, uh, you know senior executives uh, are not necessarily. I mean, they have worked in technical fields, but they like to um, read information or talk in a way that is um, non-technical or you know business friendly. Mm. So, and, and that's uh, that's a plus for me because I know that I've come from a non-tech background, so I talk with them in their language, so they understand it. But I think um, if you keep asking them the right questions. Mm. Uh, at the end, you'll find your answers. So it and and ha it happens with us all the time. People come with us. Oh, we need pen testing. And to me, I know that they don't need pen testing. All they need is um, two hours of consultancy to understand. Okay, they might need pen testing next year, but they don't need it now. Mm. So it's always about um, have that. Um, so f for me, it's not about selling our services. It's about understanding customers' pain. So if I know what the pain is, then I can deliver the solutions according to them. Mm. So I think it's always asking questions. Why you need? Why do you think you need this? And the, the customer will tell you. Yeah, yeah. And I guess as you engage with them more and more, yeah. and you service provide provide service to them for longer, you get a, a strong relationship to find out more about their needs. And yeah, and I think also when you're having that first conversation, don't go with the intention that you're going to sell them. Go with an intention that you're going to build a relationship with them. You know, uh, br bring your personality to the table. Mm. Share them you really care um, mm. and thank them for their time. And if they don't do business with you, they at least appreciate that um, you know you shared with them something knowledgeable. Mm. So for for me, that has worked out for the last three years, right? Um, I don't go to the first meeting that I'm selling them something, but I try and listen to them as much as I can. And then I feel like, okay, maybe they need it or maybe they don't need it. Uh, but that first meeting just helps. Great, thank you. And I've got, I've just got loads of questions. That's fine. <laughs> I have loads of questions. Here That's why I'm really here. Um, no, th thank, thank you, and thank you to, to you guys for asking great questions. Um, so you haven't done it all on your own. No. You've learned along the way by talking to the right people. How, how have you, who have you looked to, to advice from, and, and, and how? Um, the question from Rachel. Thank you. Yeah, um, so my dad, uh, he's been a founder um, himself, like he, he ran a company in India, uh, quite successful for over 20 years, mm. and now he's retired. Um, so he was m more like a mentor, I wouldn't say advisor, but uh, he always said, do it if you think that, um, you, f you really feel that it's coming from your heart, don't do it because you think that there's money in it. So, I mean, we're doing it for money, of course, but mm. don't, don't start with that intention. Um, yeah. So he's been he's been my advisor for a very long time. I, he he don't give me as much time on business these days. But uh, um, uh, I think in the second year I tried and um, connect with some local business communities. I found what other founders were doing. Um, mm. I read. I I I think that the great thing about my my. Um, my thinking was that I should be out there talking to people because my journey was kind of different to other people because I don't come from you know cyber or IT background. Yeah. So I um, I started writing on LinkedIn. So that helped me gain an audience of people that resonated with what I was writing. So I I made a bunch of friends and found some really really interesting people who were doing running successful businesses. So I just reach out to them and ask for help. I think. Uh, always ask questions mm. and then you you won't get your answers if you don't ask questions so mm. that's what I did that's great um, and actually did your heads just come with another question um, which actually picks up on something we, we were talking about early I think you'd started talking about um, having this sort of one of a better term a portfolio of resources among all the ethical hackers um, do your heads interested in understanding more around how 
how that works. Um, are they? Con you mentioned bounty as well, so let's mm -hmm. dig into that. So, um, are they? employees, contractors, how does it all work? So how do you find them? Yeah, they're kind of like, you know how it is, it's like more like an Uber model, mm. where we are the, so they, they bring their own taxis, it's their car, mm. right? But we pay them, we take a cut and we pay them, but they're not our employees. Mm. They are contractors, um, but yeah, the term is freelancers, I would say. Yeah. So they're not tied to just working with us, they're free, they can work with other similar platforms or they can just work with us, it's up to them, um, mm. yeah. And how do you find them in the first place? How do mm. you make those connections? That's a really, I thought this would be the easy part. <laughs> this is the hardest part, yeah. building a community. Um, so the heart of this platform is the community, which is the people who are driving this platform. And then we've also now, thanks to uh, natural language models, also are working in the AI. But um, it's if, if you don't have these people, then who is going to provide these services to the businesses? So uh, what I did was I started, if you guys know what Medium is, Medium, I, we write blogs on Medium, so we deliver high quality educational content um, that attracts these kind of skill sets, which is you know ethical hackers, penetration testers, mm. security analysts, and um, when they like something uh, or they, they learn something from our blog, we leave a link for them to sign up to the platform. So, I, uh, and, and I did the similar strategy on Twitter as well. So the last 60 or 90 days, our blog has reached over um, 280,000 people mm. um, across the globe. And my, my Twitter personally has reached over 1 million um, yeah, impressions. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think it's always, when you start with the intention of giving back, you always um, get, I, I, I don't think you get as much as you gave them, but you get something in, uh, in return, for sure. So um, that's how we've been building the community, if that answers his that question. That does, that yeah. does. And uh, we're getting more questions around that and exactly where we mm. want to go with this conversation, understanding how you did this. To the extent you feel comfortable talking about your business model, of course, it's potentially confidential, so don't go anywhere you don't want to. <laughs> how, but how, um, and I'm sure this is a question you've been asked before, hackers are hackers, these are ethical hackers. How do you know the ethical such that you can build trust with them? I mm -hmm. guess that's a, a question a few people have, have sort of and I've, I've, to yeah. Us. And because we are, you know, we are New Zealand's first. I've been asked this question every meeting I go to every Let business. Sherry, Sher so thank you for your question. Yeah. Sorry. So yeah. Um, how do we how do we identify that these people are ethical, right? Yeah. So uh, we have um, partnered with a third party vendor that does their background checks um, and they give us the score. So for example, we have people working from Australia, New Zealand, India, US and Europe. Um, mm -hmm. So this company um, uh, does their background check and runs, I don't know, like what security checks that we need to know and then come back to us and say, yep, this, is, this person's clear, um, no criminal records or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So that's one part. The other part is um, mostly these uh, hackers are coming onto a platform to Earn uh, social credibility, right? Mm. So they want to they want to work with the University of Waikato, so they can get something in return from University of Waikato. So then they can go back to their community and say, "Hey, look, I got a thank you letter from the university because I helped them find vulnerabilities." So it's not just about the money; it's also about social recognition. So these people are motivated to not do the the bad things. So we are basically encouraging encouraging them to help other businesses to find bugs yeah. and not the other way. So, so it's, it's, a, it's a very cooperative um, yes. system you've got going. Yeah, uh, but and, you know, the, every, every, um, every system has flaws. So what mm. we've done is, um, for example, if someone from your um, university is interested to do ethical hacking on our platform, once they register, they'll have to sign NDAs, disclosure policies. They have to agree to all sorts of legal documents, mm. and then they'll be run through by you know the, the third party vendor. Um, the the background checks, and then we know that this person wouldn't go rogue because he's only here to help other yeah. businesses. So we try and do the best as we can for, yeah. and then we also support them. We train them. We provide them the knowledge that hey, if you do things ethically, this is this is a path. This is how you can do it. Um, no, I, I and 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 I you know during my research, I haven't found any um, hackers that have done anything uh, illegally on you know, you know, similar platforms in the US as well. So, I mean, Department of Defense uses um, 
the similar engagement with these um, hackers. So they mm. perform similar background checks. You know, they um, they run background checks. They they see their um, LinkedIn, their social profiles, and that's how they onboard them on their platforms. Mm. Mm. And ha what's your sort of pool of, of ethical hackers that you generally draw on? Is uh, it a large, large it's pool I've, we've got I think over a thousand hackers oh, so now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So a big a big a big portfolio of resource heads to heads to account for. Um, is there anything to? I mean, again, I don't want to ask any questions that may trade any confidentialities around your business model, but obviously the client, mm -hmm. University of Auckland or Waikato, or whatever the client might be, they get they know who's doing the ethical hacking, or is it? Is I it mean, not, um, not so there either. would be different engagements. So they they there could be an engagement where um, the business wants to know where exactly this person is located, right? Who exactly this person is, or sometimes they. They don't have such requirements because we've done the the background checks. We we know who this person is. So uh, I haven't I haven't come across any um, situation or conversation where they have specifically asked. Uh, I want to know who this person is. Uh, as long as we are you know following the rules and we know that these per this person is you know um, hmm. free from any criminal activities. Then yeah yeah. yeah. Um, th th quite a lot of questions around this area because it is it is such an interesting. <laughs> You know, an unknown for for many of us, for for me um, definitely. Um, I guess it's again part of building trust over time. And, and thank you again, David, and also Clinton for follow on questions there that, that relate to this sort of area. Um, is there a possibility, and this is this is kind of lending itself to, to Clinton's question, a possibility that, that that they may be finding out more about how to if if, if you had a, a hacker. Who wants to be an ethical hacker for a particular project, but they're still learning about vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. Eventually, give, gives them an opportunity to learn more about how to get around things as well. I would say that, but is that just part of the beast? I guess no, the it's, nature of it? it. It's similar to what Security Lit was doing, right? Right. So we would have internal pen testers working on different clients, and yeah. we signed the contract with them. So they've signed a similar agreement with them. So there's yeah. no way I think that they would do something like this, yeah. Yeah. unless there has a valid reason for them to do it yeah. i don't see yeah and obviously yeah, not yeah, had that yeah. problem so no, far no yeah. no no not so far no that's but great. it's an interesting question yeah you have to think about <laughs> you'll be find, trying to find yeah. a solution to that now so that's, <laughs> we'll take to the next stage in your uh, platform uh yeah who knows um I, i've just got so many questions coming through i'm not going to have time to get to any of mine but luckily it's fine it's fine as long it's as we're fine. answering the, the these great questions and a lot of them allude to the same things um so let me just look down the list this is really nice, really nice kind of question, and I, I think you've you've talked a little bit what motivates you as a person. So I think it'll resonate. Um, Samantha's asking the question, you know, what does success look like for Capture the Bug? Um, is it mainly financial, or are there other factors you mm. you targeting and want to you know track your business on? Uh, okay, um, it, 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 to some certain extent, it it should be financial because mm. you know we're raising funds, and I don't want to. Um, upset any of my investors <laughs> but uh, me personally I think to me what success looks like is, looks like is that I am um, going to bed with peace of mind yeah. and everyone who's working with me is going to bed with peace of mind they're, they're healthy both mentally and physically they know that they're in good hands they're with good company they enjoy the culture they feel like they're part of something big they feel like that that you know they're on a on a journey of changing or revolutionizing something, um, that for me is success. I'm, I can't do it alone. So I want people to feel like that it is, it is theirs. It's, mm. it's their company. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I think um, money follows that. I guess. Yeah, I mean, it has to be cohesion. I guess. Yeah, absolutely fine. No, no, please. Um, I'm going to bounce on a little bit because I do. There's some interesting questions coming up, so I'm just going to bounce around the topics slightly. Going back a little bit, this is uh, Olya's question. Thanks, Olya, again. Um, again, going back to that initial meeting or, or any any meeting with a potential client. Um, obviously, you've got a you've got a more clear idea as time goes on as to what your value proposition is. Mm -hmm. But do you actually have anything um, material to show them in terms of the functionality of the system or the platform? Yep. Do they need to see that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for capture the bug. Um I think it's different to secure the lid because it's a platform. Mm. So they're and they're concerned about um, our security as well. Yeah. Uh, so we have to show them who uh, you know what domains where we are hosted, what servers are we using, what technology we are using, uh, what are the third party uh, we're integrating with. Mm. Um, so we um, send them kind of like a detailed. Uh, 
architecture of our platform and also who we are using um, for cybersecurity, um, how how good we are in you know making sure that we are secure ourselves. So that, that kind of questions do always come up. So what I do is, before actually going to the meeting, I send them this pack. So I know that they're well aware of you know, what we are and who we are and what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Great. Jahed's got another, another question, this is good. <laughs> and it's, uh, this actually is getting into one of the topics I did want to talk about as well. Um, because um, we, 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 one of our courses is looking a little bit about the financing of startups, mm -hmm. financial management course. So good question. So um, tell us a bit about, again, to the extent you feel comfortable giving confidentiality, um, how, how the capital raising process went for you? What was your journey? You know, What were the initial triggers? How did you know you needed to pursue some financing? Um, how did that work? Um, so for Capture the Bug, we're still actively fundraising, but uh, I, can, I can talk a little bit about the journey. You mm, have to understand yeah. how the financials work. So for example, pre-money, you're um, in a certain state, you know, and, and the investors comes on board and say, well, we'll give you $5 million. So you need to tell them, what are you going to do with that $5 million? Mm. Um, so for example, if you have only two customers today, how are you going to make it from two to 20? And how are you going to go to other geographies? Mm. And they, they, go, they, go, they go in detail. So when you're talking about um, scaling the teams, who you will be hiring, um, if you're going to another geography, why do you think you should be going to that geography? Have you done market research? So all sort of things. So it's mm. not just one thing that I could you know, like talk about. Um, but there are um, resources by Callahan Innovation and Ice House Ventures and different other um, investors around um, you know, how to raise funds and stuff. And there are accelerators that help you as well. So mm. for Capture the Bug, I was part of the Electrify Accelerator. I'm part of the Founder Catalyst, um, and I also we recently secured um, seed grant from Callahan Innovation. So, yeah, I think it's it's it, it depends on how much you're raising and what you're going to do with that money. Mm. So it, that just changes the equation every time. Yeah, and were they mostly focused on, you know, seeing the value in this, or were they also looking at issues of risk? I mean, how did they consider that? Yeah, I mean, see, investors want to um, they want to invest in a company that they can, you know, make 10x off. So mm. if you can tell them that if you invest in me five million today, it would be ten x in five years. Mm. They just want to know how you would do that, mm. and if they can, if they're confident, you are confident that yes, you could do that, and uh, they'd like to understand what your competitors are doing, how you will compete with them, you know, um, um, internationally because New Zealand is a very small market. So I think um, market research is really, really important. Mm. It's not about risks too much because in the early stages, the investor is backing you mm. and not so much the product and the technology. So your experience, your research should be should be really solid. Yeah, great, excellent. Um, Gordon, thank you, Gordon, for ne your next client. Going into that kind of prospecting um, side of things, you know, new business development, which is which is key to our master's program, which is a great great question to ask. Um, how do you start prospecting and, 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 and sort of finding out who those new clients might be? How do you prioritize who you're going to speak to first? You know, where do you place your bets and how do you decide? Um, see, I started, I think what has helped me uh, for the last two years is my presence on the social media platforms. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, I mean, I don't go to many networking events, but it has helped a lot of people. So I think, again, being a founder, you have to be also okay with uh, that this is not me mm. um, and not just stress you yourself so much about, oh, you know, I really need this sales, but I, yeah. this makes me uncomfortable. I mean, you will be, you will be uncomfortable all the time because f entrepreneurship is not easy, mm. but uh, I think when I started, I, I did go to a lot of events and I um, put myself out there, but I think over time I just realized that that's not who I am. I mm. think, uh, and for me, it's important that I understand the person first before I can actually offer them something. So mm. just to answer um, his question, I think I, I, I won't say I, I prospect on LinkedIn, but I think a lot of my clients have come from LinkedIn because they love what I say. Mm. Um, I think they can, I don't know, somehow relate to my journey or they like my journey. Mm. And then uh, the conversation starts. And mostly, it's not the person that I'm speaking to is my business or you know my potential business, but they might introduce me to someone else. So mm. that how, that's how it has worked. But yeah, mm. um, 
there are a lot of um, sales tools, I guess, these days um, mm. for email marketing and stuff. It, I think it, it, you will have clarity once you understand what exactly you're selling. Mm. Great, lovely. Um, great question from, from Samuel. Thanks, Samuel. When, when you've got your, your, your ethical hackers um, mm -hmm. hacking away, um, do, do you have like a crib sheet of things they should be looking for, or do you just let them, as, as Samuel says, go wild, do what they do naturally <laughs> and find things? How does it work? Yeah, so um, it depends on the company, right? So for example, mm. tomorrow University of Auckland uh, says, well, this is our website, mm. find the bugs then that's their scope. That URL is their scope. So anything that they find um, is basically uh, w w what they will report about. Mm -hmm. But the University of Auckland will be really smart. They might they might say, OK, you just need to stick to just one URL, and you're only looking for critical vulnerabilities that might lead to data breach. So that's mm -hmm. you know bringing down very, very short and narrow the, um, the context of it. So then the hackers know that, OK, uh, now we are only spending our time looking for critical vulnerabilities, because the other vulnerabilities we're not getting paid for. So it depends on the business, um, how they want to use these resources. So it's the, the, the policy that they draft, the, the scope that they, they give to the, um, the hackers. But yeah. we help them draft that policy. Great, great answer. Um, Andrew's got a great question. I, I, you, in my time of doing this over the last year, I've never had so many questions. Just, to, just, to, just to give you a sense of everyone's <laughs> Thank you interest so here. Much. Um, AI and machine learning yep. is that a disruptor for what you're doing? This is Andrew's question. Essentially, oh, I love, love, love AI. <laughs> uh, I've been uh, reading about AI for the last one year, and um, when I got access to OpenAI's um, DALI. Mm. I was so fascinated. I was just painting pictures using it, but um, so. With, in context of capture the bug, so there is the process of, you know how um, the consultancy model, we would um, go to our clients, we would um, request the scope of work, and then we would say, uh, okay, this is the scope, we will start testing from this date to this date, and once the testing has been finished, we will send you the report. Now usually these reports, uh, which was the traditional way of doing it, these reports are delivered in a PDF format, mm. uh, but what we're disrupting with AI is we're automating a, a lot of stuff. So now we're automating the, the patch assistance. So for example, if you're a company, that needs help with security testing. Hmm. We will send you the vulnerabilities, but you will have to fix them, right? Hmm. So yeah. my research has shown that every um, every valid vulnerability, a developer spends anywhere between three to four hours to patch that vulnerability. Now imagine if I give you 10 in your application. You will be spending yeah. your time and resources to research about that vulnerability, you will try and fix that vulnerability. And if you don't come from cybersecurity background and you're a developer, you're a great developer, but you don't come from that security knowledge, you'll spend even more time. So what we're doing is we are we are automating that process. So for example, if you're now and now if you're a company that has come to our platform, you have received vulnerabilities, you request um, a patch for that particular vulnerability and you get that sample code to fix in your particular code in like 10 minutes. Mm. So that's how we're using AI in our platform, mm. if that answers Yeah, that. so it's enhancing what you're doing. It's not a threat yeah. to you because no, AI no, can no, do no, the no. ethical hacking. No, 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 definitely not. I think we definitely need human skills. Yeah. Um, uh, I think I, a, a human mind is, uh, how do I say it? I mean, it's really interesting in a way that the way they are breaking into things, I'm sure that AI would be able to do it in the next few years, but I think right now mm. it's just not possible. Mm. Um, but yeah, we, we're automating a few parts of it. For example, when the vulnerability comes in, at the moment we've got a human that reviews that report, right? But mm. we are automating parts of it. So for example, when a vulnerability report comes in, the AI would look at the report and give it a severity score straight mm. away saying, oh, this is, this is a spam report or this is a duplicate report. That saves us time, yeah. meaning our businesses or our clients can use us on a cost-effective uh, way because yeah. now they're not, we are not spending time on our resources, meaning they're not also, it's not expensive anymore, that yeah. service. Great, excellent. Um, Zeng Li, question from Zeng Li. Um, how do you guarantee consistency, which is a good question, because um, well, I guess every client's got 
different needs. It's not a one-stop shop in terms of everyone. You know, you're not offering a fixed service. So you're offering a, a, a service based upon client, client mm-hmm. needs. But how do you ensure consistency? You've got people with different skills, hackers with different skills. Um, you know, how do you make sure that you're providing a consistent service? And do you offer training to? to the hackers to, to help them um, So in, in cybersecurity, basically to report vulnerabilities, we all um, follow SCVSS standard. So mm. every every hacker un, is familiar with that standard and is reporting mm. using that standard. But um, for example, we, we've received, we have five clients. Um, out of five, three are looking for web application pen testing and two mm. are after mobile or you know I don't know network penetration testing yeah so we what would we do is um, we would look at the database of our hackers and we would say oh okay we've got 10 people who are really skilled at finding bugs in web applications and then we've got 50 people who you know good at mm. so it's it's because we're asking heaps of information from our hackers they're building a profile and we're also gamifying um, their profiles as well so the more they provide us we rank them um, on the leaderboard, so they're also motivated. They have, you know, where we're going to be introducing some hackathons and CTFs, so they're engaged. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. So you're actually seeing them as your customers or clients too. They well are. By, yeah. They are our customers. Yeah. So we're not just we're not just responsible for good quality services to our businesses, but also our our hackers. That's really nice. I like that. Very cooperative, you know. Very, yeah, very because I, I think um, there's a sleeping um, security community in New Zealand, and I want more um, New Zealand researchers to be part mm. of, um, you know, our, our, our platform. Yeah. And there might be some people who are really interested in ethical hacking, but they don't know how to start or where to start. So they can join our platform. We will introduce them with different uh, modules of training, so they can they can at least get a hands off or taste of how this actually works. Yeah. So I think it's, if you. If you give them the seed, then it's up to them if they really want to try it or not. But mm. if if it's if, if it's not possi- possible for them, or if they don't know where to go, like I didn't know where to go, so that becomes really really mm. frustrating. So our platform is just it's 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 as I said, it's a community driven platform. So mm. it's driven by the community. So are you tapping into widening your scope in New Zealand, tapping into pools of potential people as, hack- as hackers here? Yes, yes. So yeah. we've been um, uh, we've been sponsoring uh, Capture the New Zealand Cybersecurity Challenge with the University of Waikato. I'm actually wearing the hoodie. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, and I love that. I meet with students every year who are mm. really really excited about um, cybersecurity, pen testing, ethical hacking. Yeah. So we're thinking of doing something similar from next year for Capture the Bug as well, where mm. we would run um, virtual challenges um, in house. The platform and we'd also do some um, you know challenges physically that's great thank you that's good we've had to get you introduced into people here at the University of Auckland as well oh yeah I would love that not a problem <laughs> um, Clinton thank you Clinton um, this is quite new in New Zealand this uh, is very new is it? yeah you're, you're a pioneer in it as we mentioned earlier um, do you, do you sort of monitor the regulatory environment as well? Are there, regula- are there emerging regulations that affect hacking and ethical hacking that you know you need to be aware of? Um, so, Government Communications and Security Board last year in February. Yeah. So we became New Zealand became the really um, latest nation to introduce vulnerability disclosure programs. So, our government has now mandated um, vulnerability disclosure programs for all federal agencies in New Zealand. Mm. Um, and that news actually gave me the confidence that okay, this is the right time because I was actually thinking of doing something like this. Um, I had the plan ready, but again, I was a little bit uh, about okay, what happens if the government doesn't allow it? But when the government said okay, do it for federal agencies, I thought okay, I can use this mm. as a marketing tool. That's quite credible. To, yeah, <laughs> yeah, because the, yeah. the government is saying right. Mm. So, yeah, I sorry, I lost the question, but I hope that. Oh no, no, just emerging regulations, if there are any. Yeah, no, uh, not not in New Zealand, not 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 that I'm aware of at the moment. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think there was um, encouragement from the the government that now they're mandating the the VDBs for federal agencies. So yeah. basically, every federal agency now on the website has to invite ethical hackers to right. report vulnerabilities. So yeah. that's a, so that's a plus positive. for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Going back, uh, another question by Tom, um, another financial question, and I do want to get to these because it is quite quite important um, for, for one of the courses that um, we're covering this quarter. Um, could you t- are there any milestones you track against based on your capital raising um, in terms of, you know, we need to, we 
I'm not quite sure we are in terms of revenue and profitability, but we need to reach these particular milestones or gating points along the track. How, how does that work? I, I think it depends on the investor uh, as well. So mm. it, it's, um, it's, it's, it's unique to every investor. So mm. one investor might be interested in technology um, and they want, want they, they're giving you the money so then you can bring this technology to the market as soon as, as you can. Mm. Um, and there are other investors who might be just interested in uh, you bringing on more customers. So it depends. Um, so the, I think the the traction would slightly depend on kind of cust the, the investor that you're dealing with. Mm. But for us, I think it's um, because we are really, really new in New Zealand. Mm. And with the integration of AI, we, we become even more unique globally because none yeah. of our competitors are using AI to automate the, the complex processes that you know bug bounty platforms open testing as a service platform have yeah. so um, we're kind of disrupting the security testing space but for us um, so for, for example Callahan innovation they're not interested in um, knowing how many customers you have or what is your revenue they're interested to know what is the IP that you have Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. How are you going to compete with your well-funded competitors? So yeah. different. So it's really, really different yeah. to um, investors. Yeah, I think that's important to bear in mind um, that for early stage startups, it's a different sort of system that investors mm -hmm. are looking for, different sorts of you know, um, qualifications of the value proposition and the, 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 the sustainability yeah. of your business. Um, quick one, Rachel wants to just pass on um, a comment that she enjoyed your pitch at the Electrify event oh. in Christchurch. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. Um, um, Trisha, um, again, going back to how you work with the ethical hackers, um, mm -hmm. do you have any sort of, in the NDAs or agreements you yeah. have with them, are there any quality metrics they've got to live up to, any standards, or is it just find the bug and you'll get your bounty? No, I think they, they need to have like a, a standard certification, more like a, most most of our hackers either have a, um, you know, a degree in, in technology, uh, yeah. computer science, or they have uh, cybersecurity related certifications uh, that are industry relevant. Yeah. Um, and then there are again, you know, beginners. Uh, so there are categories of the resources that we have and then we just divide them into um, who's really skilled at particular technology, who's just learning right now, and how do we pass them on to the next stage, so, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, I'm aware we've only got 10 minutes or so left. I want to try and get through as many of these questions. And um, just to say, in case we do run out of time, um, would you be happy to take a few follow-up questions if any students have? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm more than on. happy to connect with anyone on LinkedIn, and, and I can ask, answer individual questions as well. I that can leave super. my email with you. That is super. Thank I you. love, love helping students. Oh, that's, that's how great. I started, so. Oh, that's super, <laughs> thank you. But I will try and get through to the many questions no I think problem. I'll try to. Um, oh, David's keen on knowing what other ideas you've got. Oh. <laughs> and my, my question then will be, how do you make sure you don't follow them all and you stick to you know, your priorities? I I, it can be really tough when you're someone like me, I can tell you, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, don't give away too many ideas, but <laughs> any, any thoughts you have on, you know? It's not my so. idea, but someone mm -hmm. actually recently presented to me an idea that um, we should have um, robots reading your hands and you know, like how astrology, and yeah. at cafes, so people would really enjoy it. Um, a robot taking your orders and then telling you about your day, how it's going to be, or the, your, just like casual astrology, kind of fun future readings, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I quite liked it, I was like, oh, this is interesting. Yeah, so. That's okay. Um, question from Beda, po apologies for pronouncing your name wrongly there. Um, yeah, good, good question. So your business model, um, it, it's, it's, it's quite clear and it's developing over time as well as you learn more about your customers and what you can offer in terms of value. Um, in New Zealand, we're unique. Um, how do you differentiate or position yourself differentially to competitors? Um, I'm guessing in America, there are lots mm -hmm. of people doing this. Yep. Um, are, are you focusing geography? Or um, I guess things are international increasingly these No, days. no, I think um, yeah. we have to be really mindful where we go, right? Um, mm. Initial, sta initi initial um, um, stages are really, really crucial for any business. So we're going after India, US, and Middle East initially mm. um, to start with India and the US. Um, so we, we do have competitors in both India and the US. The only thing that makes us 
uh, first of all, these competitors came to the market 10 years ago. So mm -hmm. they really have legacy systems that, that can't be changed. Also, um, because they've been in the business for 10 years, they can't tap on the emerging market. So there are high high growth tech startups in New Zealand mm -hmm. globally that need, they are you know under stringent regulations, need cybersecurity, but they can't avail these services from these big companies because it's expensive. Mm. So with the integration of AI and you know the other automations that we're we're trying to do, we're trying to make it cost efficient for not just um, larger enterprises, but also for medium sized enterprises, mm. not just in New Zealand but um, across the globe. Yeah, so that's that gives you a sense of where you're going um, in the future as well, which is which is quite interesting. Mm. Um, I guess part of that as well is also keeping keeping yourself relevant. So Hamad, um, really to your question there. Um, it's a dynamic space. You know, you've mentioned AI. Um, you've mentioned that. Well, obviously, it's it's dynamic because people are always finding their way past systems. There's always new security <laughs> risks, new challenges. Yep. So how how do you make make sure you stay relevant and on top of the latest trends and the latest of uh, latest client needs so you're responding appropriately? Yeah. So for that, we've got um, Dr. Vimal Kumar. He's um, he's from the University of Waikato. He's the head of um, the Crow Lab. So I think for that, I surround myself with really, really intelligent people. Mm. So I know what's happening in the industry, what's happening in the, the research, what's happening in the academia, um, so that I don't get out of, you know, <laughs> if that answers That no, makes, yeah, makes yeah, absolute yeah. sense, yeah. makes absolute sense. Um, Quick question for me, sort of, um, if anyone's got any further questions or I've missed any, please just repost them. Um, I think I've tried to, there's a couple of questions that I didn't cover because we'd, we'd, we'd been there elsewhere, so do do let me know. But have you got some closing advice based upon your, your entrepreneurial journey? Um, what, what, what should people think about? Yeah, I think, um, it's, so it's, it's, um, people are listening, so I don't want to say something that um, really pushes them to become an entrepreneur. Do mm. it if you... If it's something you want to do. Yeah, yeah. something yeah. you want to do. It should come from your heart. And, and do something that you don't... F people get bored of things. Mm. So y keep in mind that you'll be doing it for a very, very long time. So and if you don't enjoy it, um, this is not for you. Mm. So it's a good thing. Try it. I, you know, I, I'm, I think everyone should try it because you learn a lot of stuff um, but do it if you are able to do it don't put yourself in financial risks because yeah. I was I had savings I was privileged to be able to start a business but uh, be mindful if you have responsibilities think about those things you know don't be reckless mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah believe in yourself always always believe in yourself even if someone says I don't think you can do it but if you feel that you can do it just go for it mm. I think you've proven that. <laughs> I think so. Um, am I right in saying, I was looking at the website, that you, you have uh, a, uh, a, a director on board now as well, is that correct, or an advisory board member? Uh, yep, so we've got uh, uh, Mike Jenkins from yeah. the Instillery, I mean Accents, he was the founder mm. of um, Instillery, um, he's our chairman and director. Mm. So when, when and because part of the um, our financial management course, I think they talk about issues of, of, of governance, when, when when did you or why did you make the decision to bring on a director and sort of you know have a board of governance? What I mean we we that? have three directors, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm myself mm. a director yep. and then I've got Akash, he's also a director, um, yep. but it's it's not it's not a need mm. and it's still a very chill and informal kind of a board we yeah. make sure that we're all sane you know that's also important yeah. <laughs> um, we're sleeping uh, mm. so for f at the moment that the board is just keeping checks on each other yeah. it's not just it's not a requirement but I think when we raise funds it's going to change yeah. and then it's going to happen really really formally how we um, bring on board as a director why we because I think um, for me I think it, it's, it's going to be really really strategic why we bring someone on board yeah yeah what are the, I mean again you may not know the answers right now but what are the strategic things that you might mm. think about in that situation uh, okay for someone um, that has experience in SaaS for mm. you know I don't know for years of your experience they might have um, experience um, selling SaaS for different geographies yeah. um, experience in cybersecurity um, they understand the regulations at least in the geographies that we're after. So I think that, that's what I would be looking at initially, but I, get that, I think um, when we find the investors, they, they'd help us a lot. So yeah. yeah, finding the right people, I guess. <laughs> Perfect. 
um, Ankita, thank you so much. Um, I think we're pretty much running out of time now. Um, thanks, thanks for some great insights. Um, thanks for your time. Thanks for promoting so many excellent questions from, from everyone out there. It's been an incredibly productive hour. I really so. enjoyed this, so thank you so much. Um, and yeah, looking forward to answering more questions, if you have any in the future. I'm sure we will, <laughs> I'm sure we will. Thanks so much to all you guys out there. Um, if you do have any follow-up questions, um, just um, email them to me through Canvas. Um, you should all my, know my name, but uh, Guy Bait, I'm the director of the program, just in case you haven't met me, because you may have started quite recently. Um, if you have got questions, please let us know. Um, Ankita, as, as she says, is very happy to, to, to address any follow-up. Um, thanks so much for your time, and I look forward to seeing you again in about two weeks. Take care, until then, bye-bye.